I'm Norman Wabiger. In this lecture, we're going to look at an important analog of a formula in classical hyperbolic geometry, which is due to Boulier and Lobachevsky, the founders of the subject. The analog that we're going to introduce to this classical formula looks dramatically different from the classical formula. And if you looked at the two of them side by side, you might not at first suspect that they have much to do with one another. We'll see that the universal formula is much simpler and more fundamental than the classical one, and presents strong evidence for the essential rightness of this point of view towards non-Euclidean geometry. Along the way, we're going to establish the dual laws to our main formulas for trigonometry in the subject. These are, in some sense, very easy to obtain. They're just what we get when we take the standard laws and replace quadrants with spreads and vice versa. But they play an important uh, role because they allow us really to be more flexible and to look at things from different points of view. So let's have just a little discussion of the founders of the subject, who were Nikolai Lobachevsky, a Russian, Janos Bolyai, a Hungarian, and Carl Frederick Gauss, a German. Carl Frederick Gauss was, at the time, the acknowledged master of mathematics in Europe. Lobachevsky and Bolyai were relatively unknown and both struggled with the novelty of their discoveries. They struggled with the fact that their fellow countrymen did not acknowledge and understand and accept what they were doing. So in some sense, their lives are tinged with a certain amount of sadness, especially so in the case of Bollier. The story of non-Euclidean geometry and its history is told from a somewhat radical perspective in my math history lesson on, in the math history series number 12 I talk about non-Euclidean geometry and more about these eminent mathematicians and their discoveries. I will talk more about them also at some later date in this course. Today I want to look at one particular formula that they discovered which is this angle of parallelism formula which has this form. Now, Bolya and Lobachevsky worked in a geometry in which they didn't really understand what they were doing, but they had a very good intuition for it nonetheless. So in their point of view, they were looking at a geometry in which Euclid's parallel postulate was replaced by something different. And if you have a line at a point not on the line, then there were sort of an infinity of lines through this point, which were parallel to this given line. And of those rather infinite family of lines, there were two in particular that were distinguished in that they sort of converged to the given line. One in this direction and sort of one in this direction. And they often drew pictures a little bit like this, trying to represent this this idea which was quite firm in their minds, but they had a hard time actually drawing pictures of it. So this is supposed to be two straight lines, one here and one here, and they are parallel in the sense of Bully and Lobachevsky in that they sort of meet at infinity. And at this point here, we can drop a perpendicular, and then we get a little segment here which has a certain distance or length according to Bollier and Lobachevsky's idea of geometry. And then there's also an angle here between this vertical and the second line. Let's call the angle alpha. So Bollier and Lobachevsky and Gauss, they all thought that distance and angle were the fundamental sort of notions of metrical geometry. We now understand, at least uh, some of us do, that this is not the right way of thinking, and that it's a kind of an impediment to really understanding geometry correctly. But this was not appreciated during this time. So they said, well, in this situation, it's a little bit interesting because this distance and this angle are related. So it turns out that if you know the distance, then you know the angle, and if you know the angle, you know the distance for this particular configuration. 
And the relation is given by this formula, very famous formula. Now in the modern classical setting, where one uses perhaps the Poincaré disk, due to Beltrami originally, and then the lines are these arcs of circles which meet the boundary perpendicularly. So here's an example of a triangle. One line there, one line there, one line there. And these two lines here, they meet at this point on the boundary, which is sort of at infinity in the classical view. And so these two lines here correspond to these lines here, which are sort of parallel. And just as you know, over here, we have a distance between these two points, say D, and the angle alpha becomes the angle between this line and this line. So this is the Poincaré view of the same really idea that Bully and Lobachevsky would have expressed in a picture like this. And this is the relationship between alpha and D, and our purpose in this lecture is to explain to you what the universal analog of this formula is. So what happens when we move to quadrants and spreads? We get a much more beautiful and much more simple formula. In proving this analog of the angle of parallelism formula, which I call, by the way, the parallax theorem, we're going to need a dual of one of the trigonometric laws. So this is a good time to introduce the duals of our four main trigonometric formulas in the subject. The duals are obtained by replacing the points and lines with each other, and the corresponding quadrants and spreads with each other. So the first one is the dual of Pythagoras' theorem. We'll call it Pythagoras' dual theorem. And this is exactly in parallel with the classical Pythagoras' theorem, which is a relationship about the three quadrants formed in a right triangle. And here's a reference for that in Universal Hyperbolic Geometry 22. There's the time in the video for it. By the way, I'd like to thank Empty Space Enterprise for very industriously creating uh, content summaries of my videos in this series. So this allows us to scroll through a video and sort of find relevant uh, parts of it very quickly. Thanks very much. I much appreciate it. All right, so Pythagoras' dual theorem is, well, we have three lines, L1, L2, and L3. L1, L2, and L3, and corresponding spreads, S1, S2, and S3. And then the assumption is that if L1, L3 is perpendicular to L2, L3, in other words, when the meet of the two lines L1 and L3, this point here, is perpendicular to the meet of the lines L2 and L3, in other words, that point there, when these two points are perpendicular, this is what we might call a right trilateral. Then there's a relationship between the three spreads. And the relationship is S3 equals S1 plus S2 minus S1 times S2. So exactly the analog of the Pythagoras' theorem, except instead of having Q3 equals Q1 plus Q2 minus Q1 times Q2, they're all spreads instead. This formula is invisible in classical hyperbolic geometry. Because you never see a situation where you have two points which are perpendicular. I remind you, what does it mean for this point to be perpendicular to this point? It means exactly that one of them lies on the dual of the other. So the dual of this point is that line there. And the dual of this point is that line there. So these two points lie on each other's dual, and that's exactly what we mean by perpendicular points. Now, if one of these points is inside our circle, then the other point is going to be outside, and conversely. So if you're only looking inside the circle, you can never see a pair of perpendicular points, and you're never really aware that there's this very fundamental relationship in this situation. The proof is immediate by duality. 
Because once we've proved Pythagoras' theorem, then the dual follows just by replacing quadrants and spreads. Because remember, the formulas for quadrants and spreads are exactly identical. And the formulas for points and lines are exactly identical. There's a complete symmetry in this theory. So once you've proven something for one situation, the dual result is automatic. Pythagoras' dual theorem. The second of our main trigonometric laws is the triple quad formula, which explains what's the relationship between three quadrants that you get by having three points on a line. You have three points on a line, then you have three quadrants, and they satisfy a relation, which is the triple quad formula, or the hyperbolic version of the triple quad formula. The dual result concerns three lines which are concurrent. So if L1, L2, and L3 are concurrent lines, and we define the spreads S1, S2, and S3 in the usual way, spread S1, spread S2, and spread S3, then those three numbers satisfy the triple spread formula. S1 plus S2 plus S3 squared equals 2 times S1 squared plus S2 squared plus S3 squared plus 4 S1, S2, S3. It's exactly the same as the triple quad formula, except we have spreads instead of quadrants. So this is dual to the triple quad formula, and that's described in the video UHG 23. The formula, of course, has the same exact formula as does the triple spread formula in rational trigonometry, in ordinary Euclidean planar setting. But the meaning is slightly different. So in that setting, in the Euclidean case, this formula applies also to three concurrent lines and the spreads made by them. So the same picture as we get here. But it also turns out to apply to the three spreads formed by a triangle. So in the planar case, these two things are sort of equivalent. If you know the formula in this case, you know it here, and if you know it here, you know it here. But in hyperbolic geometry, that's very much not the case. If you have a general triangle in hyperbolic geometry, the three spreads have no special relationship. It depends on the quadrants. In the Euclidean setting, the three spreads of a triangle do have a relationship, and it's the same triple spread formula relationship. So it's important to keep that distinction in mind. So that's the dual of our second of the four fundamental trigonometric laws. The most complicated of the four main laws is the cross law, of course, and it's also the most powerful of the laws because it more or less implies all the other three. The dual of the cross law is the cross dual law. It says that if we have three distinct lines, L1, L2, L3, making spreads S1, S2, and S3 as before, and if we have one of the other quadrants, say Q3 is the quadrant between the meet of L3 and L1, and L3 and L2, then this is the relationship satisfied by the three spreads and the quadrants Q3. So S1, S2, Q3, minus S1, minus S2, minus S3, plus 2, all of that squared is 4 times 1 minus S1, times 1 minus S2, times 1 minus S3. That's dual to the cross law. The cross law is referred to here. And there are really three such cross laws, because in here we can replace this, if we like, by S1 times S3 times Q2, or S1 times S3 times Q1. So the cross dual law. So now it's time for our analog of the classical formula of Bollier and Lobachevsky, which is usually called the angle of parallelism formula. Now because in our formulation we're not using angles, and the notion of parallel in universal hyperbolic geometry has quite a different meaning than it does in traditional hyperbolic geometry, we're not going to use this term angle of parallelism formula. 
So I'm going to introduce a new name for this formula. I'm going to call it the parallax formula, or more specifically, the right parallax formula, because as we'll see, there are a few other ones as well. So the right parallax formula is concerned with a triangle which has one null point. So one of the points is null, and where there is perpendicularity at one of the other points. So it's a right triangle with a right angle or a spread of one at A3, and otherwise there is a quadrants Q1 here and a spread S between these two lines here. A1 is the null point. And the relationship is one between Q1, this quadrants, and S, this spread. So the relationship is Q1 equals S minus 1 over S. So the official statement is that if we have a right triangle A1, A2, A3, and it has spreads S1 equals 0, so S1 equals 0, that'll turn out to be the spread right there. S2, which is, we'll say, S right there, and that's non-zero. And S3 equals 1. In other words, we have perpendicularity here between this line and this line. Then this triangle will have only one defined quadrants, namely Q1, this quadrants here, and it will be equal to S minus 1 over S. And an easy first exercise is to show that this is really equivalent to S equals 1 over 1 minus Q1. So we're going to need a preliminary result, which is of independent interest. This is an important result just by itself. It's what we call the zero quadrants theorem. And it tells us when we have quadrants of zero between two points. Well, one way we have quadrants of zero is when the two points are exactly the same. The quadrants between A and A is always zero. But the theorem says that if A1 and A2 are distinct points, then the quadrants between them is zero precisely when A1, A2 is a null line. That's the situation right here. A null line is a line that's tangent to our null circle. Here are two points on this tangent line. So in this case, the quadrants between these two points will be zero. The quadrants between any two points on that null line will be zero. And conversely, if you have a quadrant of zero between any two points, then if you join those two points, you know you have a null line, which is tangent to the null circle. So our proof. Suppose that A1 is x1 to y1 to z1, and A2 is x2 to y2 to z2. Then I remind you, here is the formula for the quadrants between the two points. It's 1 minus x1, x2 plus y1, y2 minus z1, z2 all squared over x1 squared plus y1 squared minus z1 squared times x2 squared plus y2 squared minus z2 squared. This formula for the quadrants can be rewritten because we can get everything over a common denominator. And when we do so, we get this expression here. This was an exercise that I gave you at some earlier point when we introduced quadrants in the first place. Note that there is a minus sign here, and we have three terms in the numerator, two of them with a plus sign, one of them with a minus sign, and they're all squares. So if you didn't do that exercise then, please do it now, all right? And assure yourself that this really is a true relation by getting everything over a common denominator. All right, so now we can see that this expression is going to be zero precisely when the numerator is zero. But that is just exactly the condition that the line A1, A2, which is given by these three numbers, there's the J function appearing, this thing squared plus this thing squared minus this thing squared is zero. So that's exactly the condition that this be a null line. This number squared plus this number squared minus this number squared equals zero. That's the condition. And that's what we have up here once you sort of multiply by minus one here and here to get it in the same form. So there's a proof of the zero quadrants theorem. 
The dual result to the zero quadrants theorem is the zero spread theorem, of course. And it says that if L1 and L2 are distinct lines, then the spread between them is zero precisely when their meet, L1, L2, is a null point. So if you have a null point on the null circle, then any two lines that meet at that null point make a spread of zero. The spread is still defined, and it's equal to zero. And conversely, if you have two lines whose spread is zero, and they're distinct, then they must be meeting on a null point. Okay, so now let's turn to the right parallax theorem and give a proof. So the statement is we have a triangle, A1, A2, A3, and we're told something about the three spreads. We're told that one of the spreads is zero, one of the spreads is non-zero, say S, and the other spread is one. So under these conditions, then the quadrants Q1, which is opposite the spread S1, will be equal to S minus 1 over S, where S is S2. So here's a proof. First of all, this spread S1 being 0 means that A1 is a null point. That's exactly the zero spread theorem. So if A1 is a null point, then the quadrants between it and the other two points are not defined. So Q2 and Q3 in the triangle are not defined. But the other quadrants, Q1, is. And the cross dual law applies to the three spreads of the triangle and that third quadrants, Q1. And here it is. The cross dual law that we've just been talking about. S2, S3, Q1, minus S1, minus S2, minus S3, plus 2 all squared equals 4, 1 minus S1, 1 minus S2, and 1 minus S3. What happens when S1 is 0, when S2 is S, and when S3 is 1? S3 equals 1 means that this right-hand side is 0. S3 is 1, and S2 is S. So this becomes S times Q1. S1 is 0, S2 is S, so we have a minus S, and S3 is 1, so we have minus 1 plus 2, which is plus 1. So altogether we get S times Q1 minus S plus 1 all squared equals 0. And so that means that this thing here is 0, and so when we solve for Q1, we get, bring everything to the other side, S minus 1 divided by s. So this is almost an immediate consequence of the cross dual law. If you have learnt classical hyperbolic geometry, you're probably wondering, well, what is the connection between the classical angle of parallelism formula and this new parallax formula in the right triangle case? They look quite different. Here we have some transcendental functions. We have a trigonometric function or a circular function. We have an exponential function. Here we just have a very simple rational expression. So here's an explanation of the connection. But you should be aware that I don't 100% believe in this formula. In fact, I don't believe in it at all, actually, if I'm com being completely honest there are serious difficulties with defining these transcendental functions that is sloughed under the carpet in modern mathematics. So these problems have to do with what exactly the definitions of these functions are and how do they relate to an underlying theory of real numbers which are highly problematic. So the usual kind of manipulations that we make with these functions are not entirely justified. But let's pretend that they are just for this slide. And if you haven't much familiarity with these transcendental functions, don't worry, this is an aside. It's completely unnecessary to understand this, to understand our course in universal hyperbolic geometry. This is just making a connection with the classical theory. 
So the connection comes about by understanding that the quadrants Q that we're talking about is related to the usual distance D. For interior points, if we have points inside the null circle, here's the relation. Q equals minus sinh squared D. And the spread between two lines inside the circle where they're meeting is S equals sine squared of the angle alpha. Again, if you're not familiar with this hyperbolic function, don't worry. It's not so important. All right, so I want to explain how to go from here to here. So if Q equals S minus 1 over S, then it's saying that minus sinh squared or sinh squared equals, well, I'll put a minus sign here to make that 1 minus S. So 1 minus sine squared alpha divided by sine squared alpha. Now 1 minus sine squared alpha is cos squared alpha, and then this is all the reciprocal of tan alpha squared. So we have sinh squared d equals 1 over tan alpha squared, meaning that sinh d is going to be plus or minus 1 over tan alpha. Now sinh d in terms of exponentials is e to the d minus e to the minus d over 2, and tan of alpha can be expressed in terms of a double angle formula or a half angle formula as 2 tan alpha over 2, 1 minus tan squared alpha over 2 in the denominator. So if you look at this and somehow come up with a plus sign here, then you have e to the d minus e to the minus d on this side equals, well, 1 over this will be 1 over this, and I've divided by 2, so I'm going to get this denominator divided by tan alpha over 2. So a tan to the minus 1 alpha over 2, this means a reciprocal of tan alpha over 2, minus tan alpha over 2. And then when you stare at this, this minus this reciprocal is equal to this minus this reciprocal. Then we can argue that tan of alpha over 2 must actually be this e to the minus d. So here's the rough structure of such an argument. It's an argument that I don't really believe in because I don't really believe in tan and exponential functions as they are usually defined. But if you believe in those things well enough, you can have a look at this and this gives you an understanding of how, why these formulas are closely related. But let me point out this formula is much more general because it applies not just to points inside the null circle. This is a general formula applying no matter where the lines are as long as we have one null point and one perpendicularity between the three lines of the triangle. By the way, if you find it disturbing that I profess doubts about something as elementary as the exponential function or the tan function, then you might like to have a look at my Math Foundation series, where I eventually will talk a lot about the foundational difficulties that modern mathematics has with exactly functions like that, and a lot of other things too. Okay, so it's time to have a few exercises relating to this lovely parallax formula. And the first one is pretty easy. I'm just asking you to have a look at some values and convince yourself that, say, when the quadrants is minus 1, then the spread will be a half. Similarly, if the quadrants is minus 3, then the spread will be 1 quarter. The quadrants is minus 1 third, the spread will be 3 quarters. Now, I might mention that uh, Bollier and Lobachevsky both realized that their, their formula implied something interesting about the hyperbolic geometry they were studying that was not happening in Euclidean geometry. And that was because the formula that they discovered meant that there was an absolute scale in hyperbolic geometry. In the Euclidean world, the world in which we seem to live in, there is no obvious scale 
that's predetermined. We have to decide what we mean by one meter or one foot or whatever unit we're using. But in the hyperbolic world, you can take one of these triangles with one point at infinity and a right angle. And then you can say, well, why don't we choose this other angle to be something canonical, like 45 degrees. So if that's 45 degrees, then the associated distance d, whatever it is, is some kind of fundamental unit that's picked out by the geometry. We so we're seeing something like that here, too, although the setting here is, is different, but you can see that if you, say, like the spread of a half, and think that that's somehow canonical, then the quadrants of minus one also is playing some associated important role. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to uh, think a little bit more abstractly, and here are two more challenging exercises that are actually allowing you to uh, prove some non-trivial and important results. So the first one is the isosceles parallax theorem. So it's another version of a parallax theorem where we have one point, a null point, but the triangle, instead of being a right triangle, now it's an isosceles triangle. So we have two equal spreads of S and an associated quadrants Q. And I'm asking you to prove that Q equals 4 times S minus 1 over S squared. Our final exercise is a generalization of the right parallax formula and the isosceles parallax formula to the situation where we have a general triangle with one null point, A1, say. The other two points now are allowed to be wherever they want to be, and they have a quadrants of Q between them, and they make a spread of S2 here and a spread of S3 here. And your job is to show that this relationship is satisfied between these three numbers, namely S2 squared times S3 squared times Q squared minus 2 times S2 S3 times S2 plus S3 minus 2 times Q plus S2 minus S3 all squared is 0. Here are some examples. And now an exercise for dedicated classical hyperbolic geometers. You might want to think about this general parallax formula and ask yourself, well, what's the associated general angle parallelism formula in the classical hyperbolic geometry when we restrict ourselves to points which are inside the interior? So we've now finished 32 lectures in this series on universal hyperbolic geometry. This is the end of the first part of this course. And in our next video, we enter something of a new phase. So we've established a lot of important results. We've laid the foundations for the subject now. We're in a position to go and develop a lot more things. But we're not going to do that right now. We're going to shift to something parallel to hyperbolic geometry, but we're going to go back to a more elementary point of view. So it turns out, as I've probably mentioned, that there's another non-Euclidean geometry besides hyperbolic geometry, and that's called elliptic geometry, or closely related spherical geometry. And in fact, that's a subject which goes back much earlier than does hyperbolic geometry. In fact, arguably, Non-Euclidean geometry was studied thousands of years ago when people were studying the celestial sphere and trying to understand what is the geometry of the sky above us. Remarkably, it turns out that the formulas that we've developed so far in universal hyperbolic geometry apply almost verbatim to the elliptic geometry case. 
and shed a lot of light on spherical geometry too, which is very closely connected. So we're going to reorient ourselves. Our pictures are going to be looking quite different now, but the formulas will be remarkably the same. So next time, we're going to start thinking about spherical and elliptic geometries. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.